Hi, you've tuned into CKUW 95.9 FM here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I'm Tammy Wolf, the host of Truth Before Reconciliation. Uh, you, if you're just tuning in today, this is actually a, the second episode um, here in a series that I have started last week uh, that we're going to actually get be, going to be exploring the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit people. So we're going to... Um, we're actually going to be doing an ongoing series. This is the second uh, episode. I have a really great speaker who's joining us today, Jamie Smallboy. She is um, an, a mother, an advocate, a student, a traditionalist, and the founder of the Red Ribbon Skirt Project. She's actually joining us today all the way from British Columbia, beautiful British Columbia. Um, so I want to welcome you, Jamie, today. Hello. Welcome. Dante. Hi, hi. Um, thank you for having me, Tammy. Um, not to go based on Nesigason. Um, I come from Escuchis, Alberta, but I do reside in um, Vancouver and I want to acknowledge <clears throat> and honor the the people of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tleilotooth um, nations. And I want to honor their ancestors as they have all suffered deeply to allow us to this opportunity to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so I thought maybe we would we would just start maybe a little bit um, but telling the listeners a little bit about yourself and, and kind of introducing like what you do, maybe how you how you became involved in uh, in the, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two spirit people movement. OK, um, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. The missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, Movement is something that I, I feel very strongly about. I'm very passionate about what I do and the families that that have lost loved ones. Um I guess to 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 get to um how I how I started the group, I'd have to first share with you how how I even came to know about um about the march. <clears throat> so because of colonialism and the impacts of um their systems. I ended up being a child of the 60s scoop. And um, so I, I was disconnected from my family, disconnected from our culture, our ceremony, the way of life that I knew. And I was, you know, in Calgary and I was in care and I was among strangers. And I I didn't understand why out of 12, 12 of us, why was I the only one that ended up in care? I I really felt like there was something wrong with me, that they didn't want me. Like why, why was I the only one in care? <clears throat> Um, then, of course, my life took um, a horrible, a horrible change in direction, and I got lost. When I started having children, um, I moved to Vancouver, you know, to give, find more opportunity, because there's nothing on the reserve. You're on the reserve. There's very limited resources, limited re uh, opportunities to, you know, um, nurture and build, you know, kind of an enriched life. So I came here. My children ended up being in care um they got apprehended from my sister and when that happened I just um fell apart I was homeless I was on the street and while I was on the street I witnessed this whole different lifestyle mm -hmm. um there were so many of our indigenous people out there so many of them hurt and and sick from all kinds of afflictions right. not just addiction mental mm -hmm. health issues for sure issues that are just getting tossed aside um society has no room for them in their colonial mold I guess you could say so mm -hmm. in my travels I came across three women <clears throat> there was Joni Nicole and Roberta and Nicole still um I carry her in my heart because she really took care of me now this is this I think is what made me cry that day that I first came across the march Nicole was a sex trade worker and and I I was just a homeless person you know trying to comfort myself with whatever I could whatever substance that I could she came to take me under her wing. She was from um, Kana. She was a blood, a blood um, from Blood Reserve, and um, these women that are out there, they're you know when you think of Hastings or you think of Young Street in Toronto, you think of these hard ass, you know, cold hearted people that are out there, but that's not them at all. These women were caring. They watched over me. They took me under their wing. They taught me how to stay warm, you know, with newspaper, taught me how to build shelters with cardboard and shopping carts and dollar store. They taught me all of this. But Nicole was different. She would come wherever she was, whatever she was doing, she would come and find me and make sure that I was okay. 
but she would come and she'd be beaten a lot of the times like she was beaten where her one of her um ribs was broken and kept kind of you know in, affecting her breathing and um she's i've seen her beaten with both eyes swollen shut and i asked her like and this was from her her boyfriend i guess um asked her why does she stay with him and he's like she he watches over me he takes care of my money but really he's just taking all her money and he spots for me and I didn't know what spotting was so she explained what spotting was to me and then I told her well I could do that for you like if if that's the only reason you're staying with this guy that beats the crap out of you I can spot for you and spotting is you go to the you go where it is that they're going to go for their find their date and you um, write down the description of the vehicle, the description of the driver, and the license plate number, the time that they left, and if she said where they may be going. And then if they don't return, then you're supposed to bring that to the to the cops to let them know she left in this vehicle at this time and then not back. But you try, Tammy, and bring that to the cops. They'll tell you, like, F off. Well, she's the one that went. She's an adult. Like, well, look what she does for a living. You know, that kind of response. Because there were times wow. that she didn't come back. There were times that she came back and she was so beaten. One time she had a chunk of her, her hair ripped out from, from her date. So, and this is again, why um, it bothers me so much because I eventually told her that I, I I'm sorry, it's emotionally hard I, to be your spotter. Yeah. It's like, I, I I'm sitting there you and you don't story. come back for an hour or two or three. And I'm sitting there thinking, did this guy go and kill her? Is she beat up somewhere? And it's so nerve wracking to sit there waiting for her to come back. And she understood. She's like, that's okay. I, I get it. You know, not many people can, which was why I had, you know, him. And then um, mm -hmm. I told her that I was worried she'd go back to him. And she's like, I'll, you know, I'll make it. I'll, I'll figure it out. That was the kind of girl Nicole was. She'd figure it out. About two months later, Nobody's seen, heard from her to this day still. Nobody knows whatever happened to her. Um, I can't remember her name. Her name just slipped my mind. Um, Serena, I think it is. Um, she was one of her, they're called sisters. Like, you know, they're sex trade workers. Yeah. They keep an eye on each other. Yeah. Right and mm -hmm. um, I seen Serena. I hadn't seen Nicole. So I went up the street to where she usually is. And I had seen, no, it was Serena. Serena was her name. And I had asked her, have you seen Nicole? I haven't seen her. And she's like, no, I seen her a couple of nights ago, maybe three nights ago. That was the last time I'd seen her, which was odd because this girl was out there all day, every day. The only time she'd leave was to do dates or to go, right. you know, get her what she needed. And to this day, we still don't know where she is. Still do not know where she is. Her sister still doesn't know what happened to her, but she also is down there as well. So when one day in, in um, 2011, I woke up and I was hungover in an alley. And I heard drumming and Tammy, I really thought that I was losing my mind. I thought that my hangover was that bad. I was having DTs and I went to follow the drumming. And before I turned the corner, I kind of got scared and thought, what if there's no, no drumming? And I'm literally hearing things, but I turned the corner and there is hundreds of indigenous women marching and singing and praying. And there was medicines being burned. And it was just, I was like, just so amazed that this was happening in the city and I stopped one of the marchers and I asked like what what are you guys doing I didn't even know our people could do this why like what is this for and she's like um it's for our missing and murdered women and oh it just made me cry because I thought right away of Joni and Nicole and Roberta that I still don't know mm -hmm. I don't know whatever happened to them so from then every year after that I attended the march and then I got clean and uh I got sober and I started um my own healing journey and in, in that healing journey um my sister gifted me some ribbon skirts because that part of my life that identity was dormant for so long in my life that um I forgot when you attend ceremony <clears throat> you have to identify yourself um in the spiritual realm as a life giver I had no skirts so my sister gifted me ribbon skirts and that whole summer was spent and she's sewing and people are coming over and, you know, there's a lot of healing that goes on when that, when the sewing of the skirts is being done. Right. When I came back to Vancouver, I wanted to bring that with me to these women because a lot of the women that went missing um, that haven't been found or that have been found murdered, never got that ceremony. 
that they needed when their lives were taken from them. And, right. and the families that were left behind, I wanted to give them that, to try to help them feel, you know, a sense of solidarity with each other, but even though it's in grief and pain, but that they feel connected, that they don't feel alone, that they're not the only ones that are missing loved ones because of this right. epidemic or this genocide that's going on in Canada. So sure. in 2019, I woke up one morning with this thought in my head, and I like to think that it was the ancestors telling me to make 100 ribbon skirts and give them to the families. So I most of it came out of pocket that first year. Dresso Fabrics on Hastings here in Vancouver were the first ones to um, gift us red material to make the skirts. Then I started reaching out for um, uh, friends of mine that I wanted to help sew, and I reached out to Holly Desjardins and Michelle Paquette and asked them, "This is what I'm doing. Do you want? Would you want to help me? Because I know they both sew." So they're like, right. "Yeah." And and then it just started growing from there. So that was how the red, red ribbon skirt. Um, project that I created became to be a part of the Missing and Murdered March. Um, and the Missing and Murdered March Committee, the women that are here in Vancouver, um, welcomed it so, so greatly. They're like, this should have been done years ago, you know? Right. But there again, too, like you look at the Missing and Murdered March Committee, the women that originally started in the 70s, um, like 30 years ago, 30 years right. ago when they started this, they had a lot of resistance. They didn't get very much support, but they went every year. Every year they would go there and they would march and they'd pray for our lost loved ones. And um, with colonialism and you know systemic uh, discrimination, any monies that are out there, the non-Indigenous people grab them. And it's like they're using our genocide as a money grab. And that's so infuriating. You look at different... Um, you look at social media, for example, you see so many organizations selling MMIW merchandise, mm -hmm. <clears throat> saying they're donating to the families, and they're not. They're literally, I don't even know if genocide appropriation is a thing, but they're making it a thing. They're making money off of our genocide. And then you see so many um, non-Indigenous people, and they're making these, these TikToks, and they're getting all these likes, but they're really not even touching on the tragedy of it all. They're not touching on the underlying issues that I feel put our women in that vulnerable state to where they are being stolen, they are being murdered. All these TikTokers, all these non-Indigenous people, are they really genuinely sharing that awareness to share that awareness or are they doing that for likes on their social media platform? That's Definitely. Yeah, definitely a conversation. Um, I'm actually going to be speaking with somebody who is a TikToker. We are going to explore some of that. Um, I have talked to other people in the past as well, even just about like cultural appropriation. Um, it's That's a huge one. I definitely feel, especially with one of the reasons why I don't do MMIWG uh, earrings, the red dresses. I don't personally do them myself. I'm a beater. Um, yeah, you definitely bring up a, a, val a very valid point. Um, as And I mean, as a person who's personally affected, I mean, you should be one of the people leading, right? Um, starting a movement such as the Red Ribbon, Ribbon Skirt Project, right? Um, where you're actually giving back um, to the community. So one of the things I was going to ask you about that project was um, how, so how can listeners um, get involved in that movement? So if they want to be involved, or if somebody is interested in connecting with you in regards to that, that project, that movement, how can they do that? That's a really good question. And I'm actually grateful that you asked that. So <clears throat> Um, it started here in Vancouver. And the first year that I did it was in 2019. And when I read out my um, if I were a white girl poem. When I was done reading that poem, I challenged Canada. Um, I said, this is starting here on the West Coast. I would like to see this project reach the families in every community from the West Coast to the East Coast to give back and honor our fallen sisters, our fallen right. mothers, our fallen aunties. And um, so then the second year came, which was which was this year. And the story started I guess um getting gaining momentum now there's a group in Edmonton that are doing it 
And then we're just starting a group in Calgary and hopefully Saskatchewan and, you know, on and on and on. But Manitoba. Manitoba, of course. So one of the things that um, I initially did with the ones in Edmonton was I started the group and all we need is somebody that's willing to um, take the initiative and lead because they're going to need somebody that, um, you know, can accept uh, monetary donations via e-transfer, somebody that's willing to delegate um, different responsibilities, like you deliver packages, you help me make the packages, um, you, you know, handle the fundraising, we'll do all do the shopping, you know, stuff like that. So that right. Edmonton just fell in like that. Calgary, we're just in the beginning stages of that where they're, um, they're just, con the, the women are just connecting. I call them the sisters because they're all, we're all sisters. So right. the sisters in Calgary are just connecting, um, starting to get the, well, who's going to do the fundraising? Who's going to, you know, go out and ask these Indigenous organizations if they'll give us the space to sew, if they'll give us monetary donations. So that's what they could do is um, I just start a Facebook group, a Facebook page, and then I just start inviting people in that area. And that's right. what anybody of your listeners all across Canada can do the same thing. Start a red ribbon skirt project, start inviting your friends, have right. them share it to different pages. And then it, it just falls into place. Everyone just steps up because right. we're each born with different gifts and different strengths right. and different things that we could do. And it all comes out together. And the fact that it's for something so sacred as the ribbon skirts and something so important as honoring the victims and the families of course right. creator is just going to come and pull that all together you know and make it happen the way that it should happen so um if they your listeners would like they could reach me on facebook under my name or they could reach out to red sisters gathering they could reach out to the red red red, red ribbon Square project in edmonton and calgary and they could just follow follow those leads and start their own i would love to be involved like the and you're just making it sound so um attainable you know what I mean like I would it, love it really to be <laughs> the leader of the red ribbon skirt project here in Winnipeg so I mean if anybody if the listeners are out there and they're interested like in collabing or like I myself do sewing and I would love to gift um families like you know myself I have lived experience um mm -hmm. you know having lost loved ones so yeah, so inspirational. I'm just so I'm just so happy to have you come on and and tell the listeners like how easy it is to like just get out there, spreading awareness, um, getting involved, um, and coming together for like such a great movement. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess we are kind of running short on time. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, um, some of your ideas and perspectives, like being that you're in Vancouver. Um, and for me, like, I always like to say, um, MMIWG, you know, ground zero is here in Winnipeg. And then in Vancouver, um, I did want to talk a little bit just about your perspective on, on um, how you feel that movement is, 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 I guess, growing in in bc and in vancouver especially with highway of tears um you know obviously there's robert picton um his brother apparently was recently was recently spotted um it was an unconfirmed spotting of him um mm -hmm. there and so what are your thoughts on that um <clears throat> again i i want to i want to honor the women that started the missing and murdered march um originally 30 years ago because had it not been for them to stand up and say that this is wrong, this is wrong, then us, you know, next generation wouldn't um, have that voice that they started. They're the ones that put themselves out there, went against everybody and everything and said, look, Canada, this is not right. Our women are getting murdered and you don't care. You're doing nothing. The police are doing nothing. Um, they're making us look like we're disposable um, human beings and we're not, we're life givers. And they, the fact that they they stepped up and they made that initial movement to stand up and tell Canada this isn't right to tell Vancouver that this isn't right in your streets right here right now thousands of women right. you know over the past you know how many decades thousands of women are being murdered and you're doing nothing had it not been for them paving that paving that path then others that are following them like myself wouldn't 
have that much more of a voice. And then hopefully the younger ones will be even more of a voice. We have to teach Canada and society how to treat us. We have to teach them that we are worthy of respect and protection and, and honor as life givers, not just indigenous right. life givers, all life givers, because without our life givers, there would be no life. There's no reason why in Canada, our women are born with targets on their back other than what society has groomed them to be. Other than that, their own racial prejudices, their own stereotypes, their own entitled beliefs that they're above us, that we're nothing to them. So because these women started that movement 30 years ago, and then us younger generation are following suit with things like the Red Ribbon Skirt Project. There's another red dress project where um, they're putting red dresses out along the highway of tears to honor the victims there. All these different movements like Take Back, MMIW Takes Back Canada, all of these movements are because these one certain group of women said enough is enough. Our women deserve life. And the ones that were stolen, they deserve to be looked into. Unfortunately, the rest of Canada doesn't see that way. The, the inquiry, look at that. Where are the actions? Why are they not returning those investigative reports from, from the police? I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I think because they're covering up for themselves or each other or things that we don't know about. Um, I don't know what it's like in Winnipeg, but I'm pretty pretty certain it's similar to, similar here. I was downtown here and I a cop came and it was raining and I literally had just sold my jacket. And he comes to make, well, there was two of them came to make fun of me. And I said something like, oh, you just come to crap on me. Um, even though it's pissing outside, like they came to mock me. And he's like, I don't know if I could use this language or not, but he's like, shut the F up. No, okay. Well, he told me, shut up. Swore at me again and said, do you want to go missing? And I looked at him and I didn't know if he was joking if you were serious. So I did not know how... How do you respond to that when a cop says a that police? to you? When a wow. cop says that to you, what do you, how do you respond to that? I didn't know if he was joking, even if he was joking, that's a pretty sick joke. So for our police force to have that kind of mentality, that's mm -hmm. very scary for Indigenous people or Indigenous women. That is, because who do you run to? I, yeah, I definitely feel like, you know, this, like, this is just a huge topic, like, Policing, I know that policing was mentioned in uh, in our last episode with Sandra Delaron. Um, obviously, like when we're looking at the national inquiry into MMIWG, uh, my thesis personally looks at the issue of policing. Why? Because police are the only system mandated to investigate the missing and murdered women. They are the people who are in charge of that. And so there are obviously some, it, there's an ongoing conversation. Um, I think we're probably gonna try, try to have a show that specifically talks about police um, here in this series because it's just so, it's so large, right? It's just such a, like we're, we're, we're getting close to the end here. We're, um, I'm, I'm, I think we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, oh no. But okay. I definitely, I honestly, I, I commend you for bringing that up um, because people need to hear about it, right? Like the listeners who are out there um, need to hear about it. Um, so hopefully I think I would like to have a conversation that looks a little bit deeper into that because you've experienced it firsthand. I've experienced it firsthand. How many other people, how many other Indigenous women have experienced it firsthand when there's, when there's the people that are supposed to be protecting us. And you know, it's not even women. Like the youngest, the youngest victim of Highway of Tears was, um, I think her name was Monica Jack and she was 12 years old. And I think it was 76 or 78 that, that she had gone missing and they didn't find her body, her remains until 96 wow. or 98 it was. And she was 12, she was 12 years old. The Highway of Tears is a long stretch of, of highway between Prince George and Prince Rupert and just recently yeah. my nieces came here and they drove home and they were being followed and it's such a secluded long stretch of highway right. and they were terrified they phoned my nephew and he got in contact with the local police and it was a male officer that attended first and he was blowing it off 
it was a female officer that actually took them took them and you know made sure that they were safe brought them to a hotel and whatnot if my nephew wasn't there to help them you know who knows where they where that could have happened but Tammy I want to thank you so much for welcoming me onto your show this is such a huge topic and my hands go up to you hi hi for being there um to bring this out to the to the public thank you so much Jamie um I can't thank you enough I wish we had more time as do um, I this is, why, this is why I'm doing a series because honestly this topic is just it's so it's so large. There's just not enough time, um, especially in half an hour. Do you have a final message uh, for the listeners that you want to leave us with? Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of your sisters. If you feel that somebody's coming to you because they're afraid, don't turn them away. If you feel like you're afraid, reach out to whoever is around you. Reach out. Just be aware and take care of each other out there. That's that's all I can say. That's It's up to us. It's up to us to take care of each other. Thank you, Jamie. Definitely it is. It's up to us. Um, That's what we talk about here on Truth Before Reconciliation, building those relationships um, and and really trying to take action um, in the community. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Um, Thanks so much again, Jamie Smallboy, for coming in. Um, Hopefully we will maybe have you on in in the future um, to talk more. I would like that. that. Um, And then also, if you're interested in being involved in the Red Ribbon Skirt Project, please connect with her or connect with me. I I would love to be a part of it as well. I think me and Jamie are going to do maybe a little bit of a collab. Definitely. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So thank you so much. You are still listening to CKUW 95.9 FM here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I'm Tammy Wolf, the host of Truth Before Reconciliation. I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Please come back next week. We will have our third guest in the series on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit people. I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.